Previously on the British Broadcasting Century. January 1923, and live from London, daily broadcasts, and now concerts from the Opera House. But what of Birmingham, Manchester, and Newcastle? The BBC's second and third stations have been beavering away since November the 15th, 1922, and Newcastle since Christmas Eve. In mid-January 1923, director of programmes Arthur Burroughs journeys to 5IT Birmingham and 2ZY Manchester to see what's what for himself. Yes, Arthur Burroughs is on a road trip. The petrol was a lot cheaper then. Sigh. This time, hear the voices of some of those who were there. And let's meet Jude Montague, granddaughter of one of the first musicians to broadcast from Manchester, Sidney Wright. Spanning Britain, or at least England, on the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is Manchester and Birmingham. Hi. Well, hello, hello. It's Paul Carenza here. How are you? Hope you're doing well. Uh, last episode, then, we had the Dutch concerts from The Hague. Uh, this episode, we're meeting a granddaughter of a pioneer. In fact, you know what? I've met another granddaughter of a pioneer this week. I've been touring my one-man play, or stand-up history, as I prefer to call it, the first broadcast. And in the first broadcast, I play Peter Eckersley, and Arthur Burroughs. Now, if you've stuck with this podcast at all, you will be familiar with the names Peter Eckersley and Arthur Burroughs. I got a note just before this one-man show uh, last week in uh, Barnes in West London, and it was from Peter Eckersley's granddaughter. She was in the audience. No pressure then. I was about to play him on stage. I should say, I'm not a major actor. I'm kind of a comedian who likes a good story. But then again, so was Peter Eckersley, really. So uh, it was uh, thrilling, marvellous and brilliant to meet Caroline, Peter Eckersley's uh, granddaughter. And I believe she may be sending more family members to the show. So if you are a, a descendant of Peter Eckersley, who listens to the podcast, I believe there are a few of you, uh, then greetings to you. And do say hello if you're at a future show. Uh, in fact, say hello anyway, whether you're a grandchild of a pioneer or not. If you listen to the podcast, do uh, say hi at the first broadcast, paulcarenza.com slash tour. You can find details of where and when we are. New venues are being added all the time, including Salford. Had to go to Salford. Made a particular effort to make sure it was somewhere near Media City up there. Uh, so if you're a BBC staff member, do spread word in the organisation. It'd be lovely to have some BBCers coming along to hear how the BBC began. Uh, also, recent additions include St Albans and uh, Devon. I'd love to get a venue in Burnley. Birmingham and Newcastle, uh, Glasgow and Cardiff. They were early stations and they're still really hubs of the BBC today. So if you have or own or you know, anyway connected with a venue, even a small venue, a church hall, a village hall in Birmingham, Newcastle, Glasgow, Cardiff or anywhere that currently doesn't have the first broadcast, get in touch. Paul at paulcarenza.com will reach me and paulcarenza.com slash tour has dates and details. <laughs> Now, speaking of grandchildren of pioneers, then, we are collecting them on this podcast. So, yeah, this week I met uh, Caroline, daughter of Peter Eckersley. This episode, we meet Jude Montague, granddaughter of early broadcast musician Sidney Wright. We will hear from her shortly. I think our first grandchild in touch with the podcast was David Jervis, grandson of H.J. Round, uh, and then David Edgar. Uh, the playwright, who is the grandson of Percy Edgar. Radio 4 Today is Justin Webb, grandson of Leonard Crocombe, the first editor of the Radio Times. We'll hear from Justin next episode. That's a great conversation. Those of you who join us on Patreon already have access to the full Justin Webb video version of that uh, conversation. Next time, the audio version uh, in bits. And I've also just heard from Robert Godfrey, who's uh, the great-great-grandson, we've never had a great-great-grandson before, of Godfrey Isaacs, head of the Marconi Company. We've mentioned uh, once or twice, especially in the parliamentary debates and those meetings in the summer of 1922, as they dreamt the BBC into being, really. And Robert's been in touch about a thesis, actually, based on some minutes that have recently been discovered, that maybe hint that actually Godfrey Isaacs, the Marconi boss, may be the person responsible for the BBC idea in the first place. And also the academic behind that research, David Prosser, he's also been in touch, bizarrely, in the same week about his thesis that really puts Godfrey Isaacs as the guy who came up with this monstrosity of British broadcasting that we now love and enjoy and tolerate and endure. We'll be chatting to all of these people on the podcast soon as we get very, very 
geeky about it. So uh, do add to our collection if your grandparent um, was on the BBC in the early 1920s or somehow made it happen. Paul at paulcarenza.com. I await your emails. But as for this episode, we will be hearing shortly from another pioneer's grandchild. That's Jude Montague, uh, the granddaughter of Sydney Wright. But firstly, we're going to follow the footsteps of BBC Director of Programmes Arthur Burroughs. Right, so we left him en route to the Midlands. The opera broadcasts were happening in London, but Arthur Burroughs was on the road inspecting Manchester, but first of all, Birmingham in the second week of 1923. So first, let's stop in Birmingham, where the station director was the aforementioned grandfather of playwright David Edgar, Percy Edgar. I think most of us who were in it from those early days realised the enormous responsibility that we had in going into people's homes, uninvited, really. And it is a great thing to realise that one had been accepted and... One made friends of listeners in those days. One felt that they, the listener really was our friend, you know, and the enormous correspondence we had proved that. The uh, number of letters which, which came into us was really staggering. Letters of praise and some of criticism too, which we all always welcomed because at that time it was the only guide we had as to whether we were giving the public what it wanted. I think uh, 90% of it was acceptable to them. Ah, Percy Edgar, such an erudite man, and so many wonderful clips of him. I remember a soprano who said she couldn't reach an extremely high note in her song unless she was allowed to take her hat off. The Birmingham staff also took pride in their excellent transmission quality back then. It was better than the other stations, really. Their very first broadcast on election night was seen as an antidote to the election. They were giving us music and fun and concerts while others were bringing the election results. Perhaps then if the London station 2LO was essentially BBC One, maybe 5IT Birmingham was BBC Two. Here's Chief Engineer of Birmingham, A.E. Thompson. I had my wireless experience in the First World War in North Russia, but I'd never had any experience of transmitting the human voice or music. So that when I arrived in Birmingham, although I had no qualms about getting the station on the air and efficiently and quickly, I was a bit concerned about problems like uh, where do I place various types of artists in front of the microphone. Where does one stand a soprano and a bass? And what does one do when one has the the, military band, for example, or a pianist? Because the microphones in those days, of course, were not so highly efficient as they are today. We had what is called a double-button carbon microphone, which was undoubtedly the best microphone available in those days. But even so, you had to stand at a reasonable distance from it, uh, uh, say four or five feet, you see. And if you had a military band and you wanted to get all the instruments over, you had to place them in certain positions around the microphone so that they, they, you may preserve the balance. In Manchester, they tried to avoid the dodgy Peel Connor mics that London had used. They had a thing called the Photophone. It was a bizarre contraption, six foot long, built into a room of its own. The studio was actually the old boardroom, and they had this flimsy sheet put up, like a fake wall, which kept the microphone away from the performer. But there was a hole in that sheet with a horn poking through it, so you could shout through that hole into the horn, which was the microphone, and that was you broadcasting. There was this odd, delicate mirror as well. I'm not an engineer. I don't quite know why a mirror was part of it. But it was so delicate, the tiniest air movement would affect it. So apparently the Manchester engineer's catchphrase was, Keep that bloody door shut! Glasgow, within a few weeks, would favour the Western Electric double-button microphone. Manchester would claim this mic as well from its new station's opening, which was in August of 1923. And that double-button mic also went to 5WA Cardiff and 5NO Newcastle in that same month of August as well, replacing those old Peel Connor microphones. Across the land, the microphones of 1923 kept on evolving. But back in Birmingham... On top of that problem, 
where there was the one of acoustics. Well, uh, we soon ran into that trouble. We hadn't been down there more than a day before we realised that everything we were transmitting sounded as though it was coming out of a biscuit box. So then I sent somebody down into the town and said, by yards and yards of woolen material, we've got to drape these walls. And we draped all the walls. Of course, we naturally went too far. We hung it on the ceiling and we hung it on the walls and we had a thick carpet on the floor. And the result of all that was, of course, that everything was as dead as can be. And the fir- I remember the first uh, artist that we put on there, they, they couldn't get their voice back to get the pitch. You see, an artist re- relies on the pitch coming back to, to keep in tune. And they used to stand in front of the microphone there with beads of sweat pouring off their face, <laughs> trying to get some kind of a <laughs> comeback, you see. Well, of course, but that all sorted itself out in time. A.E. Thompson there had a wall map on, uh, well, on his wall, I suppose. Thompson said of this map and the pins on it, It means a listener in at each point has heard Birmingham and notified us. Because, of course, they didn't know who was listening and where they were listening from. Ultimately, there ended up being a pin in every county in the country on that map. Every nation in the British Isles had someone who was listening. The Birmingham 100-mile range was exceeded. The Times did report a few geographical quirks of British broadcasting reception back in the day. The London programme wasn't just for London. It could be heard faintly in Yorkshire, quite strongly in the north of Scotland. In fact, the Scots could hear London more strongly than the Newcastle programme. Southampton and Portsmouth could hear 2ZY Manchester quite easily, but the London programme not very well at all, even though they were just down the road. 2ZY Manchester had letters from all corners of the British Isles, including this from County Down, Ulster, over the sea. We are pleased to announce the excellence of the wireless concerts transmitted from your station. The singing and music is quite clear, and the clarity of tone is excellent. Or this, from Taunton, in the southwest, who could hear the northwest quite easily. If this is a specimen of what we are to receive in English broadcasting, I think that we have every reason to congratulate ourselves on our good luck. The Newcastle station 5 and 0 could be heard in Gibraltar. London was heard in Bridlington. Sometimes Paris and the Hague stations were clearer than the BBC across the British Isles. Some places, though, no signal at all. Didcot, Newbury, on what is now the M4 corridor. No, you just wouldn't really hear the BBC. And the same could be found at the time in the United States and in Holland. Just little black spots. Many at the time thought it was contours, or perhaps the presence of water nearby, or just atmospheric conditions. All of these were possible. It's a bit of a dark arts reception back in the day. It needed fine-tuning. Even listeners could affect other listeners, as in the case of this letter to the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, January the 10th, 1923. Sir, on Friday evening last, between 6.30 and 7, someone in this district, and apparently very close to me, commenced using a wireless set, or rather misusing. Could the person concerned have heard the noise he caused my loudspeaker to make, he would have immediately shut down, as we were unable to hear our own voice above it. We were, at the time, tuned in to Manchester, listening to the piano, but all further efforts to do so were out of the question. Yes, this was reaction, or oscillation, a type of radio interference generated by listeners of cheaper radio sets. You'd only have one valve, so you'd overstrain your radios to increase the volume. You'd twiddle your reaction dial, essentially sort of self-amplifying. Your input would be listening to its own output, making yeah, a feedback loop inside the radio, but also outside of the radio as well. You would effectively turn your set into a low-power transmitter and you would bother other local listeners. For example, the Birmingham station actually stopped broadcasting during London's opera broadcasts that we mentioned a couple of episodes ago. It was such a notable thing. People wanted to listen from across the land. And in this clipping from the January 12th Portsmouth Evening News, Birmingham closed down. That meant that listeners annoyed other listeners with some rather heavy-handed retuning. Directly they have switched onto the wavelength of 300 metres. Nothing could be heard, save distressing noises. These were due entirely to people with small receiving sets, quite unsuitable for listening in to stations more than 15 to 20 miles away, trying to get the London station by using reaction. The Boston Guardian the next day reported, Every evening we hear Mr Burroughs reading his blacklist of offenders. One could not be other than impressed by the sensible appeal Mr Burroughs made the other evening. He pointed out that to bring Grand Opera to our doors, three of them were engaged. He was at Marconi House busy, the musical director was present on the stage, another was working the amplifiers. We're all working together, 
though we cannot see each other, and we are working together to put on the opera for your benefit, he said. You who are there in your thousands cannot see each other. As we are pulling together for your pleasure, I ask you to pull together. An excellent way of putting it. These clippings are unearthed by our newspaper detective, Andrew Barker. Thank you, Andrew. So in mid-January 1923, no Birmingham transmissions were on air during London's outside broadcasts from the Opera House. In some respects, Birmingham was still getting the hang of inside broadcasts. To begin with, the Birmingham engineering team consisted of four men. Mason, Amos, Delarain, and their boss, A. E. Thompson. Mason in particular was the one that used to look after the generators, I remember. Uh, they used to overheat a lot, and you know, they were in a... You know, a cubby hole under the stairs and he often he used to have to sit astride the generators there tr- struggling to keep it cool <laughs> and Delarane and Amos uh, handled the speech input equipment and there was no one left but me and I had to beside running the station I had to announce do the children's corner and all the uh, correspondence of course and uh, carry out all the, ex- uh, the experiments. To, uh, I used to have to write, the, well, I didn't have to, but I did send a report in regularly every week of the things I had discovered, you see, in, in, in the technique of, of broadcasting. So that my time was pretty full, obviously. So Director of Programmes Arthur Burroughs had stopped in Birmingham and then journeyed on to Manchester. And so shall we. Delighted to welcome now to the podcast a musician, composer, uh, radio presenter on Resonance FM, and granddaughter as well of a, a, a dare we say, radio pioneer. Let's let's say that Jude Montague's here. Hello, Jude. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Paul. Yeah, um, I am the granddaughter of a radio pioneer, and I'm very proud of that. And he definitely was a pioneer. His name was Sidney Wright. He played cello. He was an amazing uh, musician. Mm-hmm. They were often called uncles and aunties in the very early days. And the musicians, the quartets, the um, string players and, and everybody were in there with all the people who were the actors at my granddad. He was brought up in Cheetham Hill. And so he was a Manchester person all his life. Mm. So he was yeah brought up there and then joined the, went to college locally and then joined the radio. But then later on, he was in the Halley Orchestra. So he travelled the world all the time, but was always coming back to Manchester. Do you know anything much about then how he got involved in this to begin with? Cellist, he's a musician, and then somehow that moves from presumably the stage to the radio. Yeah, I do, because he was at college and he was one of the star pupils. He used to play in a quartet with other musicians and they all got the gig at 2 ZY. So they brought each other in, college friends who were considered each other to be good performers. It looks like Sidney Wright, Jesse Cormack and Leonard Hirsch formed this 2ZY wireless trio after being spotted by Kenneth Wright, the station manager, playing in Brooks Bar Picture House. Yes, the cinema orchestras could move directly to the broadcasting studio, hopping from medium to medium. Kenneth Wright was always auditioning entertainers. He allowed half a day a week for such auditions, hiring a large room in Forsyth's in Deansgate. It must have been unusual for anyone at that point. It's a whole brand new thing to suddenly go from performing to an audience to performing to a blank room. But then, yeah, and he kept going back, didn't he? He's part of this wireless... Well, some places it seems like a wireless trio. Some places are the 2ZY wireless quartet. So presumably, depending on who's available, who turns up and whether or not it's three or four. But. Yeah, they were a kind of group, a loosely associated group. That um, musicians do that, don't they? They play in different, what do you call it, different iterations. Mm. Wireless Weekly magazine. So this is October 1923. So we're about a year into the BBC's life. And it says here, Manchester, there is a morning transmission from 2ZY at 11.30 every Thursday, usually given by the 2ZY trio, which consists of Mr Leonard Hirsch, Mr Sidney Wright, with a Y, and Miss Jessie Cormack. In consequence of this, no afternoon programme is provided on that day. So um, there you go, every Thursday morning, apparently, in Manchester in late 23. There he was, right at the heart of it. And he was right at the beginning. There's a little newspaper clipping which talks about him marrying my grandmother and it says they were they met at 2ZY. Oh, did they? That's so, right, a radio romance. So what was she, do you know what her role was there in all of this then? I think she was just visiting because I can't find anything. Oh, okay. I know she used to make clothes. And she was very creative. They were both incredibly stylish. My granddad had books, uh, photos of them when they were younger, and they're all dressed incredibly modern. 
whizzing around on a motorbike, uh, going to the Isle of Man and um, just generally traveling about, really enjoying life. Obviously, having been obsessed with my granddad, I mean, his house was like a time capsule. I used to spend every Saturday there with him. He was also incredibly uh, focused kind of guy. So we had this presence. We used to sit with him. We were smoking in the lounge. And uh, I'd seen shapes and fantasies from the past in the in the air as the, I don't know, as the sun sort of came through and streamed into his it's rather Victorian or old fashioned looking house. In fact, it was the house we bought with my uh, grandmother in the mid 20s, mid 1920s. Yeah, so that was a place of fascination for me, magical mm. world. Now, 2ZY had come a long way, and we featured a little of 2ZY Manchester's origins uh, back on episodes 10 and 19 of the podcast, but I've since discovered a little more. So, old-fashioned radio voice, would you fill us in on the early years of 2ZY Manchester? The world's first radio station was KDKA in East Pittsburgh in December 1920, run by the American Westinghouse Company. But there was also a British Westinghouse. There was a man there called A.P.M. Fleming, Arthur Fleming. And he joined way back in 1900, becoming superintendent of the Transformer Department. And in the war, we can thank him for anti-submarine technology. After the war, British Westinghouse became Metropolitan Vickers. Yes, the company that ran 2ZY in Manchester. And so Arthur Fleming journeyed across the Atlantic to see American radio in action with a fellow engineer from Metropolitan Vickers, Hugh Bell. Well, as far as we were concerned, it, it was exciting, to say, the, to say the least of it. Nobody knew an awful lot about it. So Arthur Fleming and Hugh Bell came back from America full of ideas that radio could be a thing here in Manchester. And they could see the Marconi boys down south making a go of it. From May 17th, 1922, their experimental transmissions were sent from the Trafford Park station. And they actually had a smaller transmitting and receiving station six miles away in Arthur Fleming's home. That way he could check the signals were working properly. Fleming's home station had the call sign 2WH, not that he used it much. From spring 1922, you could hear, This is Dr. A.P.M. Fleming and Kenneth Wright calling. This is 2ZY Manchester calling. Then you have the summer of 1922 with Metropolitan Vickers, the Marconi Company, and other wireless manufacturers, all debating, uniting, arguing, and then forming the BBC. When Fleming reported back from America to Metropolitan Vickers, he noted a few personal preferences based on what he'd heard on the American ether. Too much jazz and popular music, he thought. Good classical programmes were few and far between. In fact, the only programmes that would appeal to a thoroughly musical European would appear to be the operatic transmissions given by Landline, as at Chicago. Well, as we know, in January 1923, London was broadcasting opera slightly by Landline, and then wirelessly radiated throughout the land. Arthur Fleming was ahead of his time, noting that musical programmes should be carefully segregated into distinct types so that the public would know beforehand on which nights to expect programmes to suit their tastes. It was Fleming's idea to use the Halle Orchestra in Manchester broadcasting concerts from the Free Trade Hall. The classical music scene is incredible. I think in the 19th century it kind of really got a boost from emigres from Germany, whether they were, for whatever reason, they were coming over I think Engel's dad, wasn't it, was something to do with that socialist history. So yeah, yeah. this was a big connection with um, German music as well and uh, um, German business philanthropists. And so the Halle was born and um, other musical societies in Manchester. So classical music had got this real foothold through this connection in Manchester. My granddad's kind of education came out of, I think he was taught by a Brahms so it was something like Brahms people taught my granddad so there was this real direct personal link to this musical history and that fed in I mean him yes but also all these other musical creatives and musical players from Manchester that fed into 2ZY and I think they were really proud of that um, regional musical uh, power that they could draw on. Ah, the days of huge orchestras would come to 2ZY Manchester. But to begin with, just think for a second, compare Manchester 2ZY's trio with London 2LO's wireless orchestra. Still not the size of a full orchestra, but more than twice the size of what Manchester studio could offer, simply because 2ZY's studio lacked space. It was a small, canvas-lined room. No larger than a council house living room. Three musicians was about all they could comfortably fit. But that did not always stop them trying. Manchester boss Kenneth Wright 
recalled they tried a few more. The original Manchester studio was very small. I remember when we broadcast the Grenadier Guards band, the players were so crowded together that several had to sit on the piano. On one occasion, John Reith visited 2ZY Manchester, saw this band of Grenadier Guards, 22 musicians in all. Now, the studio had a grand piano and a player piano, one of those that played itself, and a gramophone. It was a 10 foot by 20 foot, a curtain at one end blocking off an office, and these three burly bandsmen sat on the piano, another bandsman on the player piano cabinet. Imagine the scene. You've got this room split in half by a curtain, a studio at one end and an office by the other. And in the middle, holding this curtain, you've got announcer and station boss Kenneth Wright lifting the curtain every now and then so the three trombonists could slide out their sliders from the office desk they were sitting on. And then the curtain drops when the trombones were finished to keep the noise as perfect as possible. This was a tiny room, but a huge band they wanted to try out. Apparently the concert came over remarkably well. And John Reith, nearly seven foot of the man, he was there too, probably in the next room. But Reith was convinced that brass bands could prove to have a future in broadcasting. All thanks to this one occasion of cramming 22 of them into a room nearly as tiny as Reith's corner cupboard office back down in London. Reith was less impressed, though, in Manchester by the lack of decorum, particularly the fact that announcers were apprentices at the Metropolitan Vicar's Works, so they would be at the mic wearing blue overalls from the factory floor. Evening dress was a few years away yet, but Reith was used to having his announcers suited and booted. On one evening, Kenneth Wright was reading the news, and he was handed a note. He booked his tailor, Mr Bunny, to give a talk on coming fashions, and unfortunately, Mr Bunny, the tailor, was unable to make it after all. But Kenneth Wright did have the script with him, and so he read the talk aloud, knowing nothing of coming fashions. Unfortunately, he misread and said shirts instead of skirts. There were much guffaws from the engineers in the transmitting room. The next day, a newspaper headline read, Shirts will be shorter, says Wireless. When John Reith found out, he was not amused. Kenneth Wright. We had a unique contrivance for adjusting the height of the microphone to the singer's mouth. The singer stood on a pile of books. That was just really to fix them in position, to ground them. The microphone was positioned artificially high and uh, you could take a copy or two of the Encyclopaedia Britannica off or on, depending on the height of the singer. One night a tenor was taking a top note and he also took a step backwards. There was a terrific crash as he slid under the piano and I'm afraid that was the end of his solo and almost the end of him. Engineers and artists were occasionally foes after one particularly expressive glissando from a trombone directly into the microphone. An enormous flash occurred, and all the lights went out. The transmitter was located in a small room under the stairs. The door opened, and the engineer Basil Vernon emerged, smoke billowing around him, saying, Now you've done it. You've gone and busted the bloody valve! This, by the way, is from the marvellous book 2ZY to NBH, an informal history of the BBC in Manchester and the North West, by Ian Hartley. Copies are rare, but they are discoverable online. There were announcers like Victor Smythe. This wireless thing is one of the most marvellous things in the world. Victor Smythe joined 2ZY in Manchester in February 1923, turning up without notice in wide-brimmed hat and a long fur-collared coat suggestive of Henry Irving, so one witness said. Victor Smythe began with a comic turn and was so successful it became a regular Saturday night feature. His catchphrase at the end of the night... Good night, everybody. Good night. And occasionally to the engineer, pull that bloody switch out. Yes, there were complaints. The 2ZY studio was rather small and pokey. In fact, therefore, the engineers couldn't fit in the room. They could neither see nor hear performers in the studio, apart from what was going out on air. And so they had a control box fitted in the studio. Directions could therefore be given to the studio manager, as they called whoever was outside of the room. They manufactured this display of 15 pilot lights, so the engineer could signal to the studio instructions like OK, backwards, louder, keep steady, or close down. The announcer or performer could acknowledge receipt of this information by flicking a switch and a single light would shine for the studio manager to know the message had been received. Unless, of course, the announcer and performer were busy announcing and performing, and they forgot to press the button and light the light. 
January 1923, Arthur Burroughs felt the need to check on them. And for the next six months, until summer 1923, he would be up and down checking in on them. The assistant manager of 2ZY Manchester and popular broadcaster of the day, Victor Smythe, recalled that The infrequent visitations of Mr A. Burroughs, Uncle Arthur, caused me considerable embarrassment. I think he means generally financial embarrassment. Victor Smythe kept asking for a pay rise from his meagre ten shillings or so a week. Wasn't a lot. While London was doing outside broadcasts, 2ZY Manchester couldn't wait that long either. So the first 2ZY OB was from Manchester's Oxford Cinema. A young pianist, Eric Fogg, would play there for the silent films, and Kenneth Wright was keen that he should broadcast. And so, like in London, a telephone cable was laid between cinema and studio. And Mr Eric Fogg, playing with the unusual pseudonym Keyboard Kitty, made his first of thousands of broadcasts. He would soon be known to the young listeners as Uncle Eric. One other notable first of 2ZY Manchester is it looks like they were the first to broadcast the sounds of Big Ben. Yes, the Manchester station broadcasting Big Ben. You see, the Metropolitan Vicar's offices in London happen to be very close to the Houses of Parliament. So one of the staff members there put a phone call through to Manchester just before the hour and held the telephone mouthpiece out of the window. Therefore, Big Ben's chimes could be heard down the phone line and transmitted from Manchester beating the London station to it. On one occasion, 2ZY Manchester even rebroadcast signals from KDKA in Pittsburgh, the world's first radio station broadcast across the sea and hearable by 2ZY Manchester's audience in 1923. The autonomous 2ZY era really lasted until August 1923, so just over a year. Why then? Well, that's when the BBC set up a new studio in Manchester itself. But for a year and a bit, from May 1922 to August 1923, the Trafford Park works of Metropolitan Vickers was the home of broadcasting in the North West. While we're touring the land then in the uh, second week of 1923, worth noting the first schedule for the Newcastle station. Uh, Hit the papers on the 15th of January in the Newcastle Daily Chronicle. You had a huge listing for London, a half-decent sized listing for Manchester, an equivalent listing for Birmingham, and then a very tiny listing for Newcastle. Wasn't on quite as long as the rest of them, on nightly by the middle of January, but usually just from 6.30 until 8pm. Signal strength, like the uh, runtime of the shows, were was a little on the low side. Apparently the Newcastle station was easier to get when Birmingham and Manchester weren't on the air at the same time. Then there's the Cardiff station, which isn't ready to launch yet, because remember the Marconi company were building these new stations. But January the 9th in the Western Mail, you get a progress update. From the progress made in the work of construction at the broadcasting station in the Eldon Street sub-power station Cardiff, it's hoped that the station will be ready for testing towards the end of this month. The artists at the Cardiff station will be accommodated in the room on the top floor of the building at the entrance to the power station. Ah yes, a power station studio. That's a general tour of the land and these new BBC stations popping up throughout the early months of 1923. And yet so often on this podcast, as in the history books, we dwell on the London story, I think because, well, the London staff wrote the history books. Cecil Lewis, Arthur Burroughs, John Reith all wrote books on broadcasting in 1924, just two years after official British broadcasting began. Head office was in London and so were the people writing broadcasting story. But even the provincial stations admitted they looked to London for direction, due to the visionary slash dictatorial style of John Reith. In 19, January 1923, Lord Reith, then John Reith, made it quite clear what his policy was to be. Here's first Birmingham station director, Percy Edgar. And I've always felt that it was his foresight and vision which made broadcasting what it is today. I mean, there's no question about that at all. It it was to Reith that we owe the position which British broadcasting holds in the world today. And, of course, we all know that it is the envy of the whole world. He was an extraordinary man. I was privileged to know him very well indeed. And we had endless talks about programme content. I shall never forget... He said to me one day, now, Edgar, you've got a, a small son, haven't you? I said, yes, I have. He's five years old. Percy's five-year-old son grew up to be Barry Edgar, 
who performed on the children's hour aged 14, commentated at the 1948 London Olympics, was head of outside broadcasting, produced Muffin the Mule, Come Dancing, Songs of Praise, Gardener's World, Miss World. He said, Carol's never Sunday's, forget Churchill's funeral. that there are going to be hundreds of small sons of five years old and upwards the TV debut of Bob Munker. listening to what you broadcast. Never forget that what you say will remain in their minds for years to come. Never let anything go over your microphone which you wouldn't like your own five-year-old son to hear. That was Reith's policy. That's how he saw broadcasting, going into all kinds of homes with all kinds of people. And it was that policy, as I say, which lifted the British broadcasting high above any any of the other stations which we listen to. Manchester led the way in terms of the musical performances and then if, then the BBC Concert Orchestra we have today, is, it, it all stems out of that and the bass they have up in Salford and, you know, it's still there today. That, that thread of history goes right back to them, doesn't it? It really does. And I think it's something we don't really think about that much or as being buried, just not talked about and people move on with their lives and as London, you know, is so crazy and at the heart of things. But I think all this um, engine house of, of Manchester is, is sort of forgotten and I think it's brilliant to bring it back and shine a light on it. Well, those early days of Manchester and Sidney Wright's role in them as cellist on the air in 1923, it's all part of a new graphic novel written by Sidney Wright's granddaughter, Jude Montague. So I wanted to bring this back to life in a book. I've done two graphic novels about my own journeys and encounters with music in my life. And this one was going to, yeah, I want to do it. The thing with my grandmother at 2ZY and, and sort of tap into that, that imagination that I feel opens up for me with music and Manchester and his character. He was so stylish. Oh, my gosh. Um, their clothes and their love of things, of sort of what they considered beautiful things. It was like all treasured and kept in his hands. The graphic novel is, is on the way. Is it still in uh, in progress? And when it will be and how we find out more and all that sort of thing? Yeah, I'm, I'm planning to finish it about Christmas this year. And, um, and I've done two before, so I sort of know itch what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll just produce it myself because one can do that these days and it means yeah. I can just ride to my own timetable and everything. Ah, yes, yeah, self-publishing. Well, in fact, that's what I'm doing uh, with my new novel, Auntie and Uncle's. I'm hoping it should be out by around summer of this year. But basically, yeah, I've traditionally published in the past via publishers. But on this occasion, I am self-publishing this novel for various reasons, partly the fact that I've needed to get it out this year. And I couldn't quite be sure from the publishers I was chatting to if they would definitely get it out for 2022. And it's the centenary this year. So like Jude with her graphic novel, I'm doing this book all myself. If you would like an update on Auntie and Uncles, of course, I'll tell you here. But you can also join my mailing list and I'll send you a monthly email or so update of the various things I'm doing, the writing, the stand-up, the performing, the tour, but also the new novel, Auntie and Uncles, the origin story of the BBC, not just in podcast form, not just in theatre form in the first broadcast, but also in a novel. When the pre-order's up, I, of course, would love it if you would, well, pre-order. Support the little people. That's what Manchester and Birmingham were doing, to put it tenuously, while London was just shouting louder than anybody else. So I guess we can Google your name, Jude Montague, find out more. And That's right, because I do my radio show regularly, so I've obviously got an internet presence because of that, so you can find me. So is that a coincidence then? You're doing radio and your grandfather's doing radio. Is that is there a common thread there? I suppose there's just the influence of being brought up because he was my idol when I was young. So I always wanted to meet somebody like him. Uh, my husband here, he um, plays he plays bass and he's a brilliant musician. It goes on. The legacy goes on. There you are. Wonderful stuff. Well, thank you, Jude, for being this episode's guest. Thank you for listening. Next time, though, we are going back to London and we're going more mainstream again. Also, in terms of our guest, we've actually got, well, one of the most mainstream guests we could get. One of the presenters of the Radio 4 Today programme, Justin Webb. He will be our guest talking about his grandfather, Leonard Crocombe, who was also there in 1923, broadcasting and becoming the first editor of the Radio Times. More on Leonard Crocombe from Justin Webb next time on the British Broadcasting Century podcast.
Speaking of London, I'm also there for my very next show of the first broadcast, paulcarenza.com slash tour for details. I'm there in the Museum of Comedy, April 21st, but also November the 14th, the actual centenary day of the BBC. If you're a Londoner or if you know someone who is, send them to the Museum of Comedy for the first broadcast. And of course, I would love to bring the first broadcast to where you are. So have a look at paulcarenza.com slash tour. And if I'm not in your neck of the woods, get in touch. And you never know, I might be finding a place near you. Speaking of events, Marconi historian Tim Wander is giving a talk in Rittle in Essex on Tuesday the 17th of May. Then the following Monday 23rd, there's a guided walk and dinner in a curry house, formerly the Cock and Bell pub, where Britain's first regular broadcasts were planned. Booking link for Tim's events in the show notes. Do share and review this podcast and what we do generally online because it is just me doing this podcast. We are nothing to do with the BBC, so I need all the help I can get. If you really want to help, of course, there's patreon.com slash Paul Carenza, where you get things back in return, like videos and behind the scenesy things. But if you just would simply tell others about this podcast, come and see a show, maybe share a social media post. I thank you for it. That is what keeps the wheels turning here. And of course, come back next time where we leave Birmingham and Manchester and head back to Tuolo, London, here on The British Broadcasting Century, presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. The original music is by Will Fong. Archive clips are either public domain, as far as we know, due to age, or for those that are BBC content are used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation, and all rights are reserved. A huge thank you and a huge credit to the BBC Written Archive Centre. What a marvellous place that is. And we adore all of those who preserve, inform, educate, educate and entertain about this marvellous old origin story of British broadcasting. Thank you for joining us. Join us next time on the British Broadcasting Century.